Hey, what is up everyone? It's Rich. All right, welcome to the video. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at David Finch and sort of the passing of the torch from Mark Silvestri to David Finch. So David Finch, from what I remember, his first work on Cyberforce, I believe was this annual. And then on issue 15, he actually starts to take over the book from Mark. Um, so we're going to look at the annual and we're going to look at issue 15. I read both comics this morning and, um, they're fun and his art is, is really, really nice. I mean, you could definitely see that he's maybe a little bit earlier in his career. There's like little things. I mean, I can point them out. They're not criticisms of David works of David's work to be clear, but like little things that, that just kind of caught my eye. But overall, I thought he did a really, really good job to be honest. So this cover is cool. It's kind of got like a, a five point perspective or sort of a fix shy kind of ground plane um then you've got the characters i don't really think that they're literally standing in the graveyard because they're a little too straight up and down i mean if the earth is curving at the sort of um we'll call it the orbital sort of plane that he has it on they, they wouldn't be so straight up and down so it did kind of catch my eye like where their knees fall and then also again that they're sort of straight up and down um they would be a kind of like more of a tilt um but i mean that's being like super nitpicky but you know as, as someone who draws and tries to lay out covers that's like shit that i'm sort of dealing with where i'm like oh well if the ground plane's curving i mean technically they would be standing on this this sort of thing and you start to overthink it i mean i don't know if it's overthinking it but you know what i mean there's there's other uh issues that come into play and then you have to kind of decide well am i going to just take like some artistic liberty on it or um you know, just go for it. But when you're, when you're early in your career, you, you generally will just kind of go for it and like, let, let it, um, better to be done than have it perfect. <laughs> Cause perfect is difficult to get. So anyway, the, the, the co-plot and script is by Mark Silvestri and Mike Heisler. Mike Heisler is a friend of mine. So that's pretty cool. We've got David Finch on pencils, Aaron Sout on inks and Nathan Cabrera on colors. And then these are the color sets. Um, a little bit more. We've got Dennis Heisler on letters, and some ink assistance, which was kind of a top cow um, sort of thing. Uh, lots of assistance on their books. It's, it's just kind of the way that they, they worked. It was more of a, um, like a bull. Not, I, I don't want to say bullpen because I wasn't there. I didn't really see it happen. But I mean, at Wildstorm, when you had a book, I mean, generally you were doing it. I mean, some people would use like minor assistance, but again, usually like I'll, I'll usually compare and contrast the two. But anyway, let's get into the book itself. All right. So first page, really, really nice drawing of velocity. I thought this was super crazy, but this looks like Meredith. Now this is done in 1993. This is 30 years ago. I guarantee. Well, as far as I know, I don't think David knew Meredith in 93, but that looks surprisingly like his wife. So kind of cool. He, he created a fantasy girl and then he lived it out on multiple levels. He's been drawing comics for 30 years, and he married Velocity, apparently. All right, so anyway, I really like this figure a lot. It's I was going to say this, too. There is a chance that Mark Silvestri laid this book out for him. I don't, That would, again, only be speculation on my part. But I know that sort of, even at Wildstorm, some of the early books that some of the pencilers did, you know, Jim would kind of, like, help them break down the script a little bit. But it's not to say that, that it happened, Um David may have done all of this 100% on his own. I don't know. Uh, I just thought I would throw it out because this does feel a little Sylvester-ish right here. Um, so who knows? And sometimes, I mean, I know even for me, like Jim would occasionally sort of like go, hey, let me show you how to do it and kind of draw something on your piece. And you're like, all right, that's definitely staying because that's like the best shit on the thing that I have. All right, so we got a nice double page spread. She's basically like in a training simulation program. Uh, and because of her nature to be speedy, uh, she doesn't have the patience to start at level one. So she was initially going to start at level two and she opts to go to level five and then level five is quite the handful. So anyway, she's dodging all these lasers and stuff and she's got it under control for a bit. Again, I think this is a great pose. This is really, really good. I mean, I've like, again, I had very little, um, complaints about this first issue I, I, or this, the annual I remember buying this when it came out, too. I mean, I definitely still have my copy. wasn't going to go through my storage looking for it, though, for this video. But um, 
uh, anyway, so she gets, she's, she kind of goes like, it's a good thing they don't have traps. And then of course, like they spring a trap on her, catch her. And then she's kind of in deep right here, but guess who comes to save the day? T -t 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 Timmy, Timmy, Timmy. Come on, Tim, Tim. Oh, look, there he is. He's so cute. Anyway, so Timmy tells her, hey, you should be more careful. You could have gotten really hurt. And one, one thing that I will credit Mark for doing is that he doesn't have the lisp the little girl and Wolverine had. Because those issues, reading her talking um, with the, the lisp, drove me crazy. <laughs> it's like, stop. Make it stop. Not that there's anything wrong with having a speech impediment. I slur my S's. I have the California valley guy voice um but uh yeah it's it's a little obnoxious reading that accent um anyway all right so she apologized to timmy but then she starts to try to get timmy to basically do a procedure on her that's very very risky which is basically go into her brain box and um try to sort of make her more whole she doesn't feel like you know she has she has very jumbled memories if if even that she doesn't she doesn't feel like she's herself She's not who she is. She's something else. So anyway, Timmy says, no way. Can't do that. I've been told not to do it. She talks him into it because she's pretty. And pretty girls can make you do crazy things like rob banks, liquor stores, you know, gamble. <laughs> anyway. All right. So, so Timmy even though he's artificial intelligence, little AI robot kid, he can't pass up an opportunity to impress a pretty girl. That's what we do. All right, so anyway, they put her in this machine. It's very, very cool. This is Gabby's Gas and Grub, which was kind of cool. We saw that in the Sylvester videos, and this is where the cyber data like, complex is or subplex. Um, and this is really, really cool tech. Very, very fun. It's nice and detailed. It's got some classic Finch-isms sort of starting to bubble up into his work where you're really seeing um, a lot of things that David kind of carried out throughout his uh, career. Let's see what the science is. Free beer. Uh, chips. I uh, can't read that. Something Frank's. Probably in the comic you can read a little better. <laughs> flashback to when um velocity and uh, i mean if you saw the other video or if you read it this is ballistic they're sisters so it is kids um and anyway she's she's got a very very fast throw which is part of ballistic's ability so she's striking out this is her real father frank which is ironic because it was like i was getting punisher vibes and i was like that's kind of funny they called him frank like frank castle maybe i thought he was going to get shot in the park anyway so they have this nice kind of moment with their original parents and then of course it cuts to the wicked stepdad or i guess not yet um anyway so they're working on her they show up and timmy's got her all jacked up and they're like you know told you not to mess with her brain and you know you went and did it anyway and now look you've, you've made a mess timmy you timmied it up <laughs> for if anyone follows alpha investments you you'll be laughing because he's pretty funny and he refers to uh gullible fans as Timmy's. All right. Anyway. So, um, apparently uh, what is her name? Is this Cyblade? I think this is Cyblade. Um, so she's a biology expert, but he kind of like, she's, she's sort of, you know, making a critical analysis of what's going on. He's like, you sure you're reading that thing? Right. She kind of calls him out on um, him challenging her intelligence. But anyway, Velocity's in in a bad state. And Finch is doing this is smooth as silk. So anyway, they're hiding down in the basement. Stepdad comes in. He's been out all day drinking. Comes home. He's all pissed off. He tells the, the wife, you know, you're always talking about Frank and these freaking kids. I told you I didn't want to see him when I came home. Uh, and um, so... Uh, I can't think of what her name is in it's Karen and Cassie. I think this is I think her name is Cassie. Um uh Cassie, aka Ballistic, uh stands up for her sister and it gets a little out of hand. <laughs> so Velocity, with her speed, runs for it. Let's just try to get help. Luckily, there's a cop parked in his car drinking coffee. Like how fortuitous was that? So 
fate have it, she quickly tells him in one long run on word that they need help and you got to stop and hurry up. And the cop is like, what? All right, let's go. So then we come upon a scene, a grisly murder committed by Cassie. She threw a comb at him and basically took this guy out. I thought that was a nice touch. <laughs> she didn't mean to throw it so hard or so fast. She didn't throw it hard. So she killed her stepdad with a comb. <laughs> Waka! Anyway, now we've got Timmy. Timmy's still trying to figure out. He's trying to fix the mess that he's made. Because he timmied it up. <laughs> Alright. Warblade, the poet and warrior. He speaks wise words, but anyway, they're like they gotta they gotta get her out of here. They're um they they're gonna call in Stryker too. They need Stryker because he has tender sensibilities apparently. <laughs> I never really saw that in Stryker, the three armed guy. So this is really interesting, and I did not remember this at all. So they go to an orphanage because she, her sister killed her 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 dad, and her mom's probably a loony bin or something. Um, uh, and, uh, these girls tattoo Velocity's face. They call her Lightning is their nickname for her. And she apparently somehow got a tattoo gun and, um, <laughs> they must've held her down for a while. Cause this tattoo would take a little bit to do, but, uh, yeah, they tattoo her up and they give her the Velocity, uh, Lightning bolt whoosh. So that's how she got it. There you go. A little bit of backstory of where it came from. And the amazing thing too is it healed up fast. So Mother May I comes in, and I guess she's she's gonna pick up the kids. Uh, this was kind of funny too. I was, she tells these two that they're gonna go. So it's not Cassie. It's another girl, uh, probably the girl that tattooed her face. But I, I was kind of tripping out on how they drew her, and then it was funny because she refers to her as Bertha. And she kind of like has like a little bit of like what you might stereotypical refer to as like a Bertha face. But anyway, they pretend to be friends, but she's Velocity basically says like on the outside, she's going to kick her ass. Uh, all right, let's continue. All right. So these bad guys throw them in the truck van. They're going to take them, you know, do experiments on them and turn them into superheroes. What's interesting is I wonder who this character turned out to be. There's a little bit of potential there for a new character. Anyway, we cut to a bar in Woodside, Queens, and um, we've got a guy hitting on what confusingly feels like he was hitting on Stryker, although the jacket's different. But when you read it, you kind of go like, is this a gay bar? Like, what's going on? Like, because you only see these two in blonde hair, and he's like, you know, come on, babe, let's like, you know, party or something like that. He's like, don't you ever give up, but... He comes up behind him. It was a little confusing when I read it. I was trying to figure out what exactly was going on. But anyway, it's ballistic. She's getting sauced up in the bar, trying to forget all the pain in her life. Stryker basically comes and pulls her out of here. Oh, so... Yeah, Cassie is her name. I want to make sure. All right, and then they fly off with Velocity to take her to a place where they hopefully can um, fix her brain box. But it's a dangerous mission. Mission. And here we go. Very, very kick-ass shot of Killjoy. I mean, Dave is crushing it here. It's really, really good stuff. This is a little bit of like the early J. Scott Campbell vibe. Sort of the way they're walking. Reminds me a little bit of some of the early Gen 13 stuff. And they're training, you know, um, then Ripclaw eventually pulls her out of... Um, I guess uh, maybe she escapes. I don't. I don't remember exactly what happens. Like she escapes, and then Ripclaw discovers her in the alley. But, so anyway, we've got them flying in. They're kind of trying to communicate with Velocity, although she's unconscious. Timmy feels that she. she he's convinced that she can hear them. Uh, and then Ballistic hops on her cyber bike and starts to fly in to. Um, I don't know. She's flying somewhere. I can't remember where it is. All right. Some security. She sneaks in stealthily. Oh, I guess she she must have to disable the like security. I've kind of forgot what it was. Anyway, so they 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 breach the thing. They go in. Have some resistance. Fight them. Some nice 
nice small figures. David's hitting all the notes. I mean, he really is. I, th I thought he did a fantastic job on this. And honestly, my memory of this was, I, I didn't think that it was as strong as it was going to be, but I think this is really good, you know. In particular for his first Top Cow comic, I think he did a great job. So, you know, mad props. It's all, it's all really, really good. And, and, you know, again, we're going to look at issue 15, which is his first issue of the real book. And you can see the difference of a deadline versus maybe a bit more of a floating deadline. I get the impression that he might have had a little bit more time to draw this book than the issue 15. Speculation on my part based on the amount of detail and stuff. But this is, this is pretty pedal the metal shit. On 11 by 17 board of black and white, you're going to be doing some work to draw stuff this detailed. I don't know how fast David was back then, you know, like if he could just knock this stuff out. So anyway, they introduce a new character. This guy's name is Hotspur. I'm sure everybody's got a Hotspur poster in their room now. He's, you know. There's an interesting thing that comes up. He says something that leads you to believe possibly there's a relationship between Cyblade and him. Uh, because she basically says, The blast, almost like my own psionic blades. How do you know so much about me? Who are you? And he goes, Don't you know? Can't you guess? So there's a little bit of something, something going on. They don't address it in the book, though. But brother and sister? created from the same source i don't know wonder i wonder at what issue that was actually um shown so they actually put up a pretty good fight against these bad guys we've got buzz cut from the other issue that we saw with mark buzz cut's super big and super awesome impact shows up and this guy is, uh, what's he called? Megawatt. Megawatt is going to basically shock uh, Impulse, or Impact, sorry, because he's metallic. But anyway, um, there's a reference to Killjoy losing her hand, which I do kind of vaguely remember um, in the ongoing series, not the mini series that we, we checked out, but um, I think the first issue of the um, regular series of Cyber Force that happened. Uh, anyway, so Ballistic shows up and she shoots Killjoy doesn't kill her but does enough damage that she calls all of her people off and they um, basically skedaddle and say you know we'll return we'll fight you again another day classic comic book things anyway um velocity wakes up and she's okay and she's got memories she she remembers the abstract dreams that she had about her real parents and the puzzle pieces are starting to come together for her so i don't exactly know if cassie's memory of the events are more clear than karen's karen karen i don't know how you pronounce it karen we'll say i don't think she's a karen um <laughs> And anyway, all right, so that's that's uh, the annual. I thought it was really, really good. I was very, very impressed by David's art on it, and um, it exceeded my expectations, in particular of what David did. My memory of it was not as strong as what it ultimately ended up being, so I thought it was really good. Now, Cyber Force 15, we shall check out. Uh, we don't need to grab these. These are Randy Queen. We're only looking at Finch today. All right, so the cover is Sylvester uh, and Bat, I think. Uh, we'll check it out, though, just for fun as a setup. All right, so, yeah, Sylvester and Bat. Man, Bat came on to Mark and started doing some covers, and I remember just going like, man, who is this inker? He is awesome. So, yeah, Bat is great. Joe Weems is great. Jason Gorder is great. We've got a couple of different inkers. There's three inkers on this book, in fact. Um... But one inker did most of the work, so we'll see that one second. 
All right, so we've got Mark Silvestri, creator and art director now. David Finch Pencils. The script on this one is by Brian Haberlin and Eric Silvestri. We've got the inks is mainly Jason Gorder, but Detron did do pages 7, 14, and 15, and Vince Russell did pages 8 and 9. Colors are by Furkow, Seps, meaning the digital interpretation of Furkow's work um, is by all of these fine people. Letters, David Heisler, David Will Coplot. So Bat is art director and inks. And then there's two ink assistants on this. And Peter Steigerwald, Steigerwald, excuse me, is sacking the villain's castle. So I don't know. Maybe he's like the head of coloring. And they gave him sort of a whimsical title. All right. So this, I love this as an opening page. I thought this was freaking great. I was like, I'm in for a treat. This is going to be good. I like this kind of stuff. I'm into superheroes, but I do love me some fantasy and sci-fi. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I thought this was great the clothes are awesome the folds and stuff like that like it's really really good so my assumption would be that david did this after the first that annual so you know he's been at top cop for a little while this is still dated as 1993 though all right let's continue friends shall we this is fun i haven't read this many comic books in like a week and in, in years I think I've read maybe 15 or 20 books already. All right, so this is a history you don't read in textbooks. Oh, I'm sorry, I was going to actually read the comic to you. You don't want that. All right, anyway, so so there's three time frames going on here. I think it's the 15th century, the 20th century, and then the technology is from the future. So anyway, um, these monks, whatever they are, create the sphere of vengeance. Uh, this, I believe, is... I, it could be Evil Chip or Evil Timmy. I was, a little, I was a little confused. I definitely felt like I should have read 14 going into it. Uh, but that's not Finch, so I, I didn't go back. But essentially what you've got is... So this is Chip. This is Timmy, although he looks very effeminate in some of the drawings. It's a little confusing because at times he does look like a woman. Uh, here he doesn't but anyway um so they've got this knight on the table but there's a lot of sort of like future me past me you know kind of kind of thing going on um uh, and um again they're in france in the 15th century but they're from the 20th century and the technology is from the future all right friends so uh, they have to get the spear of antioch there's a little pun here this is timmy 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 She's like a little confused and overwhelmed by all of what's going on, but Timmy sort of explains it as people will in comics. And um, she just wants to get home and see Timmy as a little boy again. Um, but anyway, um, they're trying to entice this bad guy so that they can destroy him. And what, what it is is there's, there's an evil that will happen if they don't destroy a certain character that's ex that exists in this time frame. So that's what they're trying to do is they're trying to smoke him out so that they can kill him. Uh, Timmy tells Chip on this page that he needs to live his life to the fullest extent and that he's too, too robotic. He doesn't do anything but stay at cyber data headquarters and go on weird missions and his social skills suck. It's a little weird. Timmy just drops a bomb on him in the middle of all this other shit. I don't know why. I don't know what Timmy's got going on with himself that he needs to, to call out Chip, but he did. It's the kind of guy Timmy is. But they do say that Timmy hasn't been acting himself, but I don't know if that's future Timmy or past Timmy. It's the whole Timmy, Timmy timeline going on. <laughs> All right. So anyway, they start running down the hallway. See, like here, this, this looks to me like ballistic. But I, I'm pretty sure this is Timmy, but it looks like a woman to me. So um, it was a little confusing. I even had to go back a page or two and kind of like reread it and was like, is Ballistic there too? Like maybe, you know, I'm not really sure. Anyway, so they grab the Spear of Antioch and um, power it up and uh, knocks Timmy and Chip on their asses. So they start to leave. And he says something that I found a little weird, which is, this is just a little tech. It couldn't hurt anyone. And I'm thinking like, dude, you're Chip. You know technology can hurt 
everyone there's all kinds of shit that you guys are dealing with that's technology why would you say that chip why <laughs> didn't really make sense they know damn well that there's all kinds of robots and shit there's there's some coming up in, in a couple of pages all right anyway so the knight comes out of the ground and he attacks them he refers to them as demons and again i'm not 100 percent sure who this person is um but it, it it could it could be that but anyway this is pretty interesting so the timmy and um i don't know whoever this is they're they're fighting and um he cuts off timmy's hand and really messes up timmy's face but again timmy's an ai but he's becoming sentient they actually do refer to that it's kind of interesting that i i, I really do say that cyberforce really was was taking on stuff that like themes that were really kind of a little bit ahead of their time it wasn't that they weren't being discussed at that time but it's it's interesting being in 2023 and reading like some of the sort of future tech words that they use um uh because it it you know it really does kind of fit with today so anyway um but timmy takes his cutoff hand pokes this guy in the face and really jacks him up so it actually ended up being a little bit fortuitous anyway so they're about to whatever teleport back to earth but timmy says that he needs to stay because he's the only thing that can explode and sort of take care of a certain situation so he's basically going to sacrifice in the future also he can't go back because there'd be two timmies and two timmies is just too much timmy so countdown timmy explodes propels them back to earth present day and uh, she kind of asks like what did timmy say and um he kind of gives her sort of the quick version of it but timmy did call him out it was kind of interesting all right so then we cut to killjoy and this guy's name is zadrock zadrock is a very very cool looking character uh they've got guests coming and they're robot sort of aliens that um they're gonna try to do a deal with but the robot aliens are coming i think for something specific if i remember correctly uh, Killjoy makes a joke about, like, do you want me to kill them as they're teleporting in? And he says it's not necessary, but he appreciates um, her uh, clever ideas with the propensity for violence. So let's rotate this. All right. So we've got the Izon unit aliens. This is really, really cool. David outdid himself on this. I love this. I think it's so good. Look at this. So, yeah, David Finch, man. Dude is a badass super cool it's good stuff so they talk about the agreement that they had he's like da, 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 da. you need humans to like do this thing and uh starts to ramp up and um da, 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 da. oh he asks like uh like you know can you get the leader the leader of your people here and he says like he's the only one that can communicate with him uh and the other the others are just muscle so these other robots are just there to basically um fight him i love this man it's great nope all right that they enact their plan which is to basically take these guys out so their people come in they attack the robots they have like this double weapon thing where they're able to break down their shields and then actually destroy them but they spare the leader since he's the communicator or has the ability to communicate with the the top dog it's kind of interesting so here he he talks to him for a second and then he rips off his head and chucks it so it's kind of interesting i guess the information would still be in his head I was a little little confused of what exactly went down but anyway these guys they call it their brain case but for velocity they were referring to it as a brain box so there's these different sort of distinctions of brain capability i guess based on your um makeup uh anyway so they're back at the headquarters chip kind of gives everyone sort of a breakdown of what went on um talks about timmy uh and that they're they they're gonna have to like really do they're gonna have to deal with timmy because he, there's something off with him he says that he's noticed it he sensed that something was up this is like a doctor uh and um he talks about that it's not so simple to just like do you know to scale him back and um 
they have to kind of discover a way to do it. And uh, what is this? It was a little weird. Like, this guy says something, and then there's, like, a word balloon on his pocket, which I believe to be Chip talking back to him. But it's a little... The story time is a little bit weird here, but... Um, you know, sh we're f talking about maybe giving him a lobotomy or something like that. And uh, anyway, I again, I'm not 100% sure why CC has this device on it. And if it's maybe... It could even be uh, that he's spying. Timmy's using that to spy on them. So that's a possibility that he's using that as a listening device. And then anyway, look who shows up. Striker, and he is jacked up. He's got a ripped off arm, and he's all messed up. So we re we remember that he was protecting Ballistic at that bar. Or I don't, where did we last see him? I don't know if I'm combining the stories. I have to go back and check it out. But anyway, he shows up, and he is worse for wear. So look, there you go. There's David Finch's introduction into the the big time, the top cow image comics river of awesomeness. And I think he did a fantastic job. It's rare that you see people come in drawing so well, and he just got better and better over the years. So that was really really fun and very interesting. I think next what we're gonna do, since it's a it's an easy not easy one for me, but it's it's uh passing of the torch that that i'm aware of is wildcats so we'll look at jim lee's wildcats and then we'll look at travis taking over wildcats um now i i leaning towards just doing wildcats 15 he did do wildcats special first the only i mean we'll look at some of the wildcats special it's a big book though and i, I don't I, I mean to do both comics would be hard and the point of interest for this is really taking over the ongoing title because I know for a fact that Travis spent like a year on the Wildcats special because he, he had told me that. So so it's not fair to compare that to going into, um, quote unquote, a monthly book. So, um, but we'll look at some of the pages. Some We'll, we'll have some pick hits from the Wildcats special just to see what, what he could do with like sort of, we'll say, unlimited time. And then um, Wildcats 15, things start to ramp up. And it is part of the reason that you see his style shift on Wildcats 16 and 17, and he simplifies his work, uh, because to do an ongoing, you don't have an infinite amount of time to do it. You know, there's a schedule, and you have to keep to it. So it's challenging, and he had to adjust. So, all right, I'll talk to you guys later. Have a great day. Make sure you smash that like. All my live videos are in the live section of my channel. You'll see videos, playlists, home, whatever they call it, about, and live. Live is where all that stuff is. Also, be sure, if you haven't signed up for the Blaster Kid pre-launch, please do it. I actually was talking to a few people yesterday about Blaster Kid, and they gave me some really, really good um, advice of what they, as fans, would like to see me doing more of. And uh, it was really, really helpful. I didn't take offense to it at all. And uh, they were giving me some tips on how to... Um, engage with the audience more so i really appreciated it they will probably won't see this video but um yeah it was re really really helpful so i've had a few people sort of chime in and say hey should be doing this a little bit more you know so all right i'll talk to you guys later have a good one bye